a test. I'm not actually getting it. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay. Okay, now for real. Hello, everybody. Hello. How's it going? Everybody having a good week? Yeah. yeah? Maybe a little wave action? <laughs> okay, no, but it's, we're, we don't even, that's, that was good. Okay, thanks. I'm glad you're having a great week. I'm David Simpson. I'm the program director here at the Work Center. My pronouns are he, him. Um, welcome to our final faculty talk of the event. The first one on Monday was fabulous. Um, tonight we're going to hear from writers Sarah Ferrazan and Aaron Aceves, <laughs> along with writer, printmaker, and illustrator Cecilia Ruiz. <laughs> They're all going to do their things and talk and show slides and stuff like that. And then afterwards, they'll come up here and we'll have a Q&A. Um, but before we get started, a bit of housekeeping, same housekeeping as on Monday. Um, all of the all of the presenters' books will be for sale at the back of the room uh, after the right now and also after the event, and they will be available to sign your books after the room after the event. Um, books by other members of this year's faculty are back there, but also in the library, which is in the gallery. If you haven't, who hasn't who hasn't heard about the exhibition? You haven't. You're new. You know, if there's a great exhibition in the in the in the gallery next door, you should check it out. It's really it's really nice. Um, everybody's heard about this many times already. So, and also big shout out to East End Books, who maintains our bookstore for us. <laughs> and let's see what else. The restrooms continue to be down the hall, and the sign up sheet for Thursday's tomorrow's student night is still over there, and it's still. I agree, Sarah. It's the most supportive group that you could possibly imagine. Such an opportunity. And then it stops, because it, right, so that was good, thank you. Totally impromptu, we weren't, pl you didn't plan that at all, I know, you couldn't tell, it seemed totally spontaneous. Um, please, if you haven't signed up, please consider signing up. It's a wonderful night, super supportive. Um, it's a great, you know, it's a great audience, it's you, you're reading for each other, so. Um, if you haven't done so, please do consider signing up. And one final favor, please turn all of your cell phones to silent. And I'd like to invite, so the first person we're gonna hear from is Sarah Ferrizon, and I'd like to invite up one of her students, Connie Bewald, to introduce Sarah. Just like they do in Germany, exactly. All right. to be here. All right, so, so I'm Connie Bewald taking Sarah Farazan's class this week. Um, it is, I know this is a cliche, but it's an honor and a privilege to introduce her this evening. Um, when I saw her name in the summer program catalog, I knew it sounded familiar. And then I realized that I'd been recommending her first two YA books to students, and students had been recommending them to me and each other in my years as an elementary middle school librarian, many years actually. Um, tell me again how a crush should feel and if you could be mine. But I didn't know until recently that she'd also written a middle grade novel, Opportunity Knocks, a graphic novel, My Buddy Killer Croc, a YA horror comedy, Dead Flip, and a multitude of short works published in a multitude of places. Not only is she accompl an accomplished author in multiple genres, her excitement and openness to exploration is inspiring and infectious in the classroom. She's a thoughtful teacher who creates a classroom community where students feel free to take risks and welcome feedback. 
She teaches creative writing at Lesley University and luckily here at the Fine Arts Work Center. She has an enviable encyclopedic knowledge of pop culture and media and uses it to help us generate work. And working with Sarah is so fun. So far this week, we've sung, danced, played with vintage toys, and watched provocative and hilarious video clips. I wonder what we'll do tomorrow and Friday, but have no doubt <laughs> that we'll write and share some rich pieces and laugh together. So here she is. Everybody. That was so great. Connie made me emotional. So I'm doing okay this week. I was nervous. I was like, three hours? I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do that whole time. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. I'm Sarah, pronoun she, her. Um, I'm a Massachusetts uh, resident. And I want to thank Kyle for s uh, sending me an email many months ago to be like, would you like to teach here and I said sure and I'd like to thank David and Sarah and the whole FAWC crew for um, so many emails and zooms and support and being really welcoming and thank all of you for being here and for uh, for giving this place good vibes um, so yeah I've been I've been writing young adult and now middle grade for uh, 10 years now and uh, I'm still trying to figure it all out I think sometimes that when the dream is like, I'd love to get published, I'd love people to read my stuff, um, there's no sort of like what happens after that and how do you keep it going and how do you um, want to do work that, that you have fun with rather than um, feeling like you're doing the same thing. So um, a lot of why I write is for kids today and why I write in a young voice and I'm sure a lot of you this week it's you know you're you're checking out stuff that you were inspired by as a kid like you're tapping into a lot of inner kid stuff um, so for me I uh, I was trying to think about what I wanted to one little thing from uh, Sabrina the teenage witch had a Halloween spectacular issue in October of 1993 and there was one little segment on her yearbook page um, that had like all the people that were like her teachers and like, you know, most popular werewolf or whatever. <laughs> and I narrowed in on this panel, which was Miss Reaper, a teacher whose tests are deadly. So she was just a grim reaper, like history teacher or something. And I really fixated on that. I was like, that's what I want to be for Halloween. <laughs> so you can see my pearls, you can see <laughs> glasses to show that I'm learned. Um, I have a cow on cape and I'm holding a scythe. Um, you know, that's that sharp tool there. Uh, nobody knew what I was, um, but I did and that's what matters. And um, I think what I have always loved about Halloween, I know it's not for everybody and well, that's too bad, but, but for me, I always liked the idea of dressing up. You can be whatever you want. Um, you can be out at night, which is exciting. Um, there's candy, there's like, <laughs> like, but, um, so all that stuff I love. I love the time of year, especially growing up here, the leaves, the caramel apples, the whole shebang. Love Halloween, best night of the year. Um, the problem with that is I'm afraid of everything. <laughs> so how do you then write a horror comedy <laughs> if you can lean into the comedy part, but you're afraid all the time. Um, so this to show you, you can laugh, it's okay. I show this to kids and everything. Um, my sister works in media, and she knows I love Halloween, and she knows I'm afraid of everything. So uh, we were living together during the height of COVID pandemic, and her work said we need a segment for like Halloween. And she didn't have a camera crew or anything, we had like cell phones and stuff. And she was like, okay, we're going to go to this place in Abington, Mass, called Barrett's Haunted Mansion. But they had to close the mansion because of COVID. So they have a haunted drive-in, which they're going to show a movie I never watched because I was too scared, called Nightmare on Elm Street, which starred Freddy Krueger. And so that's going to be playing. And while that's playing, all these actors that would scare you in the house, they're going to come to your car and bang on the windows and <laughs> do all that. So it'll be great for our... Halloween segment. 
So I'm going to show you raw footage of that. <laughs> um, and feel free to do what you've been laughing. Sure. Yes. I can't tell. Okay. okay. There's no, there's someone coming around here. Coming. There's someone coming, coming around, around the, the bend. bend, and I don't. I really don't. Oh, we don't I need see to it do in the that. Mirror. We don't I see need to it do in that. We don't need to do that. This is uh, the, uh, really. I would appreciate they social distance more. Um, this is uh, there. I think the the person is just staring at me now. <laughs> oh my god! And the scene in the movie. I really don't. It's a, it's like a, he's wearing a, a sheep's head. Um, I really don't know what they're oh, carrying in gosh, that bag. <laughs> I really don't know. Um, I'm gonna pretend terrifying. it's a uh, it's a Care Bear that that, is uh, that has you know seen some rough years. It's okay. No, you don't need to come closer. I'm not like really don't need to. Are made of. Yes, they are. I'm gonna have plenty this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so Maybe if you much. Wave, he'll I'm leave. not. I'm never wave, gonna wave. wave. I'm never gonna wave. wave. I'm never gonna wave. Sarah, wave I'm really not go gonna. Away. I'm really not gonna. Oh, he just drew a heart. I, I don't believe it. It's not that kind of Care Bear. Just, I don't believe it. Just, Maybe he had a Care Bear origin story, and now it's, it's not that. Heart. And I'm really what not are you gonna. About care Bears. I'm trying to. Oh no! Now he put his glove back on. Yeah, I, I don't know what's happening. I really don't know. Uh, he just wants some love. Well, fr not from me. Thanks very much. Bye. Are they gone? Are no. they gone? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you lied to me. What is you he doing? You lied to me. What I don't do you know. Think he's, doing? he's putting gloves on the car. Oh, he's Taking a nap on, your on car. my car. That's great. He's That's really great. On your I feel um, terrible. That's terrifying. I feel terrible about all of this. Um, taking taking the bag away now yeah. there's a whole no i don't know i don't want to <laughs> and uh thank you and that went on for the duration of nightmare on elm street <laughs> so that's like an hour and a half film and at the end all the actors knew that it was like a, you know they were excited to be have be featured because they were like oh you're saving our haunted mansion great so they all shook the car at once at the end <laughs> um so thanks donna for that um, so I was wondering, okay, I want to do this. These are the books that gave me inspiration. How do I do that, right? How do I write the fun of the stuff that these things gave me? Which, like, again, I think, too, with kids, you're like, okay, like, what is the limit? Like, how far can you go? And we have to remind ourselves that, like, as I, I was a kid, I was self-regulating, right? If something were too scary for me, I would not read it. If it was scary enough, I'm like, this, I, this I'm cool with. This is I'm down with. So I loved the John Belair's books um, when I was about eight or nine. And he, uh, the great Edward Gorey art from you see on the cover. Um, and I like what I liked about them, they were mysteries, but at the end, like nothing really terrible happened. And there was always like an intergenerational friendship. So in this one, um, the librarian, I forget her name, but um, her library assistant who was a teenager was named Johnny and they would solve mysteries together. Goosebumps, I couldn't handle all of them. Like the one with the mask, too scary, can't do it. But this one, my hairiest adventure, no problem. Because he's like, oh, I'm hairy? <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm ethnic, so what? Like, <laughs> so am I. So um, anyway, but this was about, he thought he was turning into a werewolf, and spoiler alert, you know, it's just some lotion that made him hairy and possibly puberty. So like, that I can handle, but I but the idea of like that fun, that building of suspense, that and again that early 90s, 80s kind of feeling where the kid goes on the adventure. Same with Monster Squad, where um, it's like Ghostbusters but kids, and it's it's problematic. It's it's not perfect, but these were kids who like, you know, fought Dracula, who happened to be in their town. Like they all happened to be in their town at the same time, and that kind of fun adventure. So I wanted that feeling. Because um, these books really got me excited about reading, you know? And I think kids do like reading. I think it's, we hear all this kind of stuff about like, well, we can't get the boys to read, which is ridiculous. Or we can't get girls to read this. Or we like, why is reading gendered? Like, it's not. Like, people enjoy a story. You just have to find the right story for, for kids. Um, so I thought a lot about what scared me when I was younger and what scares me now? And I have graduate students do this too. Like, 
write down both those things. Um, and with a lot of horror, you know, there might be a monster like a Chucky. There might be something like that. But there's other themes and other things that are scary and that maybe we're not comfortable talking about that horror can do that for us, which is really exciting. Um, this is Alex Vincent, I believe that's his name, who is the child actor during Child's Play and is now, the child, uh, is now an adult actor in the Chucky TV series. So he's been with Chucky a long time. Um, and when I was 24 and worked in a comic book store, there's a theme of comics and all these kind of things, um, there was a part of the store that had a Chucky doll and um, at night I had to vacuum and, and I would not vacuum that area. <laughs> um, so eventually my manager was like, this is dirty, what are we doing? <laughs> and no one was buying the stupid doll. So I sat down with my mom at like 24 and uh, she's great to watch horror movies with because um, she just focuses on the wrong stuff. So we watched Chucky and she'd be like, that's just a stupid doll, I would just kick it, who cares? Um, <laughs> And we watch Poltergeist together for the same reason, to get over these fears and that sort of thing. And there's a scene in the beginning of Poltergeist in which Joe Beth Williams and Craig T. Nelson, who are the parents, are smoking marijuana in their bedroom. And my mother was like, what are they doing? <laughs> and I was like, well, they're enjoying weed in the privacy of their own room. And she's like, with the children in the house? <laughs> so the rest of the movie happens. It's going, going, you know, a long time. And at the end, not to spoil it, it's a 40-year-old movie, but you know, the ghosts come back, there's coffins coming out of the swimming pool, like everything scary is happening. And she just says, well, if they weren't so busy smoking weed, <laughs> maybe they would have noticed there's some ghosts in the house. <laughs> so again, horror and comedy, kind of two sides of the same coin, right? You have to have a setup, you have to have the making sure that people are ready to and then you have to have the payoff. So I could do comedy, I couldn't do horror. So it took some reading of these things, getting in that mindset. And I think that's for any of us who are trying to do any genre, right? And you have to learn the genre, you have to love the genre. Even if it's not perfect, even if like, you know, I don't consider myself a exclusive horror writer or, or like the scariest, but it's something that you have to, to want to study. Um. So uh, Dead Flip um, was basically the horror comedy of my dreams. Um, it's an 80s and 90s book that is paying homage and hopefully feeling a lot like the stuff I liked at that time. So like Are You Afraid of the Dark, Goosebumps, Eerie Indiana, um, things of that nature. Um, there's a lot, and also it was encouraging because Stranger Things has become so popular even though it's historical fiction. Um, and this was historical fiction. Um, so it was just really a great opportunity to not only play in, uh, in genres I wanted to play in and have fun, but I think in my thir three earlier novels, um, I used comedy and I used a lot of other devices, but they were to get stuff off my teenage chest regarding identity. And this one was just kids that shared aspects of my identity, but they got to go on the adventure, right? Like, who they were wasn't a huge part of the storyline. Their friendship was how society treats them and the horror part of it. So Dead Flip is about three childhood best friends. Corey is up top, Maziar is in the middle, and Sam is playing pinball. Um, and when they were all 12 years old in 1987, uh, Sam went missing. And Maziar and Corey became estranged because of it. They don't talk to each other anymore. They go to different high schools. And Corey's become like a homecoming queen nominee, but she's secretly closeted and in love with her friend Janet, who's goth. And Maziar is kind of a party guy jock who just kind of drinks a lot to forget about the guilt he feels about his friend being gone. So in 1992, Sam reappears, but he's still 12 years old, the same age he was when he went missing. And so Corey and Maz have to reconcile, they have to kind of babysit Sam, figure out why he's back and why all this weird stuff is happening in their town. And it may or may not have something to do with a pinball machine that eats people. This is literally, they publish that, can you believe it? 
so anything's possible. Um, but it was just so fun to play with and such a joy to be able to do that. And um, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but uh, I just encourage you, because I know you're writing for young people. You're writing for kids today, and I write for kids today because I think young people are always asking questions more so than grown-ups do. Um, they're always asking, why do we do things this way? Why is this happening? How can we change this? Whereas some of us, we get tied up in the, uh, you know, thinking about adult things, like I got to pick up my dry cleaning, or I have to pay my mortgage, or whatever. Kids are able to be more expansive and talk more about how they're feeling and um, maybe change things. There's an honesty in, in kids. Um, so yeah, if you like pinball machines that eat people, um, if you <laughs> like, and really, and this horror part of it is, you know, there's scary stuff that happens and there's, you know, um, a lot of tropes that I'm playing with and if you like 80s, 90s horror movies, you'll see a bunch of stuff. But um, the real fear that Dead Flip is about is about um, your friends outgrowing you, right? Which is a middle school fear a lot of us have, and um, and so Sam, that's he's his friends have literally physically outgrown him when he could feel they were um, growing away from him when they were all twelve. Like there were things that were entering their lives that were going to change their friendship. So anyway, that's a little about my process, um, and would love to talk to you more during the week. Um, and uh, yeah, again, if you like pinball machines that eat people, um, please check it out. Thanks very much. I'd say more applause for Sarah Farazan. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. <coughs> Now uh, we're going to hear from Aaron Aceves, and to introduce Aaron, I'd like to invite one of his students up to the stage, um, Margot Green. Hi, everybody. Whoop. Can you hear me? I'm Margot. Um, I've actually been here. Uh, eight sessions at the Fine Arts Work Center, and either I've grown up enough to relax or this has just been the most fun in this inaugural season of um, children's literature, children's and young adult literature. It's been just a real w wonderful week. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Aaron Aceves this evening. He is the instructor of the workshop on young adult writing. These afternoon sessions have been a refreshing balance between structure and informal conversations. As a facilitator, Aaron is brave, curious, witty, and open-hearted. He has a seemingly infinite capacity to listen and to respond thoughtfully. According to Christian Gregory, uh, another member of our group, Aaron, quote, builds a writer's space that is not only safe, but also lovingly messy. Here we can amble and ramble in the sandbox of our languages of love and loss. What a great description. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Aaron's young adult novel, This Is Why They Hate Us, reflects his own compassion and desire to express the vulnerability and energy of the teenage world through his protagonist, Enrique Luna. Enrique, I'm sorry. Aaron was born and raised in East Los Angeles. He received his bachelor's degree from Harvard College and his Master of Fine Arts from Columbia University. His fiction has been featured in Epiphany, The Florida Review, Passages North, JJMW, and Them. This is Why They Hate Us is his debut novel and has earned him praise as a, quote, breakout new voice in YA that's equal parts hilarious and lyrical, unquote. It was named a best adult, it was named a best young adult book of 2022 by Kirkus Reviews. He works at the University of Texas at Austin as an early career provost fellow 
Please join me in welcoming Aaron. Thank you. My classes are messy on purpose, I swear. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Um, like Margot said, my name is Aaron. Um, I'd like to thank everyone here at FOC. Um, I don't like that shortening of it either, but that's what we're <laughs> dealing with. Um, but everyone from, from David um, and, and Kyle and Sarah and just everyone who's, who's here, including my students, who both contributed to that uh, introduction. Um, right, so my name is Aaron. My author name, author name is Aaron H. Aceves. I added the H because it sounds fancy, um, but it also does stand for my middle name, which I won't tell you. Um, this is my publishing journey. So I feel with a lot of writers in the room, we can all relate to the fact that writing came from reading, right? And I actually, I didn't love to read as a child. Um, my sister is here, she can attest that when she tried to read me books as a young kid, tried to read picture books, uh, me and my brother would not have it and we would play and she'd get frustrated and be like, they're never gonna be readers. Um, and she was right about one of us. But uh, <laughs> so the first book that ever made me love reading uh, was called Poppy and Rye by Avi. Um, that was a book, I had to do a book report in the third grade and I went and I picked this book up and I read it and I did the book report and then I realized this is the third book in a series. And even then, as a child, that was not okay. <laughs> My little obsessive brain was like, you did something very wrong, you need to correct this. Um, so I went back and I read the first two books, reread the third book, read the fourth book, and I was like, okay, I'm a little more at peace. Um, but I had inadvertently gotten myself addicted to reading. What came next was a love for books about animals. I went on to the Redwall series, the Warrior Cat series, uh, Guardians of Gahul, and I didn't think about this much as a kid. It was just what I liked. If there was a human in it, I wasn't interested. I accidentally read books about humans because there was a cat on the cover, but <laughs> that's publishing's fault, not mine. Um, but what I realized as an adult is that this probably happened because every time I read a book about a child, that child didn't represent who I was. And it wasn't that I could only read about people who were like me, because that had never happened at that point. It was just, I think, I wanted to save myself from disappointment of not knowing, of the disappointment of trying a book and seeing that they didn't reflect my family structure or how I felt on the inside. Um, but also, I mean, mice with swords, like, come on. Uh, <laughs> so, if you're getting an idea of the kind of kid I was, um, this is a letter I wrote to my older cousin who had moved to New York. February 5th, 2003. Dear Jill, hi Jill, it's me, Aaron. I just wanna see how you're doing. Wrong your, but he didn't care. Or he probably did if he knew it was wrong. Anyway, I hope I could see you again because I never got to see you before you left. I wanna be a writer. I already started my first book titled Max and his friends. I might see you there one day because all the famous publishers are there, publishers are there, like Scholastic Press. <laughs> I hope you're doing well, write your. Tomorrow is my birthday and I'm gonna turn 10. See ya, <laughs> love Aaron. Um, so he was not lying. Nine-year-old Aaron had started a book and it was called Max and his friends. And let's talk about it a little bit. Um, I love this picture sans context. Um, I will fill you in. In my head, my characters look like Sonic the Hedgehog characters. Uh, but they were aliens on a different planet. Uh, and they all would spontaneously burst out into song. Uh, but the main character, Max, actually hated this and was very against uh, bursting out spontaneously into song until his friends would goad him into doing it. Um, I wish I had this manuscript because I would probably get it published instantly, but um, I don't because it was on a desktop that's probably in a landfill somewhere. Um, but my <laughs> looking back, I think the lesson is all you need to write a book is the audacity. Um, so fast forward eight years. I'm a freshman in college. 
uh, not too far from here. And my favorite movie, and it still is, is Mean Girls. And I think, what if Mean Girls were about a guy? What if it was Mean Guys? But I didn't call it that, I called it Bro. Um, and so I wrote this book about a kid who is just very much like me. Um, and he becomes friends with this very popular football star, quarterback. And I proceed to write the most homoerotic novel I could have ever, like without trying. Um, at this point, I still identified as straight. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I could have also called this novel No Homo. Um, the main character at one point is under the bed and his football star friend is on top of the bed with his girlfriend. And there are just moments like that where I'm like, how did you not know? <laughs> um, I finished this book. So I started it freshman year. I finished it junior year. And uh, I did my darndest to try to get an agent for it. Um, I got some requests from agents who wanted to read the whole thing. But even when they read the whole thing, they'd either reject it or ghost me. Um, so preparation for my dating life. Um, and it took me about two years, so a year out of college, for me to give up on this. Um, and, you know, I'm not the only one. People write books and they don't go anywhere. Um, but I was like, for sure, my next book. Um, <laughs> book number two is called Aubrey Zaim is Single. And it's about, again, a, a boy who's very much like me, who has a very popular best friend who's in a relationship with a girl. And when, when that very popular friend breaks up with his girlfriend, the main character suddenly becomes very popular because all the girls at school who want to date his popular friend come to him for advice, right? So that was my premise, and the way I wrote it was sort of based on The House on Mango Street. Uh, the House on Mango Street has one or two page vignettes. Uh, mine could be much shorter or longer. Um, so here, this is the opening of the book, and these sections are only sentences long. Aubrey Zaim. Never believe Aubrey when he says he'll meet you at Zoe's Burgers after school. Aubrey. Never believe Aubrey when he's with Carla. Ever. This book um, got a good response. A lot of people like the writing, they like the characters, but they did not like the structure. And so they told me, if you rewrite this in a traditional way, we will talk again. And again, it's kind of like dating where someone says, if you fix your teeth, I'll love you. <laughs> I decided not to fix my teeth. I don't want braces. And so um, I shelved this book. And this is the one where I, I hope one day it does come out. The first one, never, because it's horrible. And again, <laughs> I could call it no homo, and it would make sense. Uh, so moving on to book four. Uh, I can count. There's a reason why I'm going to book four. Um, it's funny, Sarah and I were just talking about the last day at FOC, where like, it's going to be like Wet Hot American Summer, where everyone's just going crazy. Um, <laughs> but the reason I put this picture is partly because of that, but also because um, it's a camp story, and it's you know kind of raunchy teen comedy. So this one, I actually started junior year of college. It started as a screenplay. So this is, again, the second book where it started as a screenplay. For me, that sort of served as an outline, and then I reverse adapted it into a novel. Um, but the reason it's book four is because there's a period where I had the first two thirds, I had the last fourth, and there's this tiny little bridge that was giving me so much trouble. And it wasn't like writer's block, it was something harder, it was like writer's brick. Like it was, um, it was really bad, and I just could not for the life of me bridge these two pieces of this almost done book. Um, and I was really frustrated, um, wrote another book, I'll come back to that, and then I finished this one and I queried very widely because I was like, this has to be my debut. It's commercial. Um, the main character is a straight white girl. Like, this has to sell. Like, this has to be my Trojan horse into, into the industry. Um, but, as you all know, I'm sure, when you try to force something like that, it usually does not work in your favor. Um, so I got a lot of passes. This was a big ego hit. And at the end of it, I was like, I've written four books and gone no like I've gotten nowhere I'm no closer than I was at 21 when I had just finished my first book and I was very sad um, but then I remembered oh yeah that other book I wrote so I wrote this is why they hit us at my sister's dining room table um, I was working a job I hated and I came home one day and I just I heard this kid and he wasn't talking it was his inner monologue but I was listening in on his thoughts 
And I just thought, hey, I'd call it jacking off if I didn't associate that nomenclature with white guys who drink Monster and wear weed embroidered socks. Beating your meat would be a front runner if sexual euphemisms implying violence didn't make me uncomfortable. Masturbating is too standard, choking the chicken and spanking the monkey are for middle school kids. I guess I don't call it anything. I just make a dry fist around my dick and go up and down until every muscle in my body tenses then untenses and I have to get up and dispose of the evidence. It's mechanical, as scratching an itch as you can get. I try not to think of anything as I jerk. On my unmade bed, still fully clothed, daring not to move because of the style and stare up at the popcorn, which only my ass kick. Pretend everything is okay what is obviously a cruel being inflicted upon them. Queer son or grandson or second cousin keeps me up at night. I was chapter two and it was a first in four weeks. And so a pretty short novel, but, um, and we were talking about, because I, my grandma can't read my first book. Um, and it ended up working out. Um, I sent it to an agent who offered a revise and resubmit, which is when you, you know, they tell you, fix it, fix your teeth, and then I'll marry you. Um, and I did at this time. Uh, and then I got the agent offer. I told other agents, I got other agent offers, and then I went with the one who I thought was best for me. Uh, we worked on it, we edited it together for nine months, the first nine months of my grad school um, tenure. Uh, and then we finally went on submission. We went out to nine editors, eight of them said no. One of them offered a revise and resubmit, which again, theme of my life. And I did that and I resubmitted and she bought it. Um, she was the only one who wanted it and so not a huge advance. Sometimes my publisher forgot who I was and what the book was. Um, I was delayed three times. I had three different editors. None of this is, I mean, Two editors maybe, one delay maybe, but I was lucky enough to have all these sort of hurdles uh, put in my way. But when the book came out, it didn't fix all my problems, um, but it was pretty fucking cool. Um, I went back to New York, because um, at this point I had moved to Austin. I went back to New York and I had a lovely event with Brian Kennedy who wrote a little country, a little bit country, um, and that was at Books of Wonder, and I had a really great time. Um, I went. My last stop was in LA, which is my hometown. This is with Adam Silvera when he was blonde. Um, and then this is in Austin. Um, and I, you can see me and my sister there. Um, all these events were great. Meeting readers was great. Um, and I'm very proud of the book that I wrote. Um, and I'm gonna read another passage, unless someone stops me. Um, so this is after Kika has gone to therapy. Uh, he's in the car with his mom. And he's, he's already come out to her at this point. Uh, it's pretty late into the book, but not really a spoiler. It's a coming out book. Um, hey, mom, I say, you know what we haven't done in a while? Reveal a deeply personal secret that's been years in the making? I snort. She and my dad have since talked about the whole our son plays for both teams but knows nothing about sports thing. Apparently, they've decided they're going to tease me about it until I die. I'm neither ec ecstatic nor upset about it. That's who they are. No, we haven't gone to the movies in a while. That is true. What do you want to see? What do you want to see? I don't know. We can decide when we get there. She drives for a little while in silence. Then she clears her throat and says, "Are you um would you pick a movie that has men in it?" My eyebrows bunch together. Every movie has men in it. <laughs> Too many men if you ask me. Why does she look so uncomfortable? What does she mean by a movie with men in it? Men together, honey. Oh. She's asking me if I'm going to try to take her to a gay movie, as if there's even a guarantee that there's something like that playing at our theater currently. 
We'll pick something together, I say. It's, only, it's the only way I can think to respond. Okay, I'm just, I don't think I'm ready to. Yeah, it's okay. I try to stop blood from rushing to my face. It's hard. This makes me think of what I heard last night after the baseball game when I was trying to fall asleep. I heard my parents talking about me. This was to be expected, but something my dad said kept me up for hours. Is it my fault? The only reason I heard it so clearly is because, because of how high-pitched it came out. It was like a cry for help. Fault. Fault implies blame. Was he to blame for the person I am? That's what he wanted to know. Did he mess me up? And what, what, and what my mom responded with made it so much worse. Is it mine? There's going to be use of the F slur coming up, just so everyone is prepared. How did my suggestion for a little Sunday matinee lead me here? I don't feel like going to the movies anymore. Now I want to go to the beach, walk into the ocean, and keep going until I'm well in over my head. Keep going until I sprout gills and fins and make the sea my home for the rest of my life. Although, with my luck, I'd probably end up running into a group of racist, homophobic dolphins. The thought makes me smile, so I keep with it. They'd call me a two-legged land faggot. They tell me to go back to where I came from. They'd be wearing Poseidon Hates Fags t-shirts and make the ocean great again hats. That last image makes me laugh out loud and my mom looks at me like I'm crazy, which maybe I am, but I'm surviving. Uh, and then the last passage I'll read from this book. It's a little further on. Um, Kike is in love with his best friend, Celine, his gay panic crush. I can't stop thinking about Celine the whole way there how his brown skin literally sparkled when we were in the water, how the hair on his face and his body grew darker, more clearly defined, how his swim trunk sagged, revealing a strip of pale skin I had never seen before. The hostess leads us to the back of the restaurant, out the door onto a clay tile patio. She points to a metal table and we all take a seat. Salim sits across from me and I'm suddenly embarrassed by how desperately I want him to touch me in any way. But I don't let that feeling stop me from inching my legs forward hoping he'll accidentally swipe me with his feet. All throughout dinner, I'm silent because my lungs won't seem to work, like I'm still underwater. I only want to say one thing to one person, but I can't. I want to say one thing to one person, but I can't, and it's killing me. What a horrible weight it is to be silent when you want to shout, to hold back when you want to reach out, to freeze when you want to melt. Um, so those are the excerpts. Um, this is the book, and this is the result. Um, <laughs> so, back in June, I got a DM on Instagram from a group that was fighting to, that was fighting the other group that wanted to ban my book from their library, uh, Samuel's Library in Front Royal, Virginia. Um, so I got this DM, started doing some research, and I found the Concerned Parents page um, where they filled out a request for reconsideration form um, for my book. And question down here, what brought this resource to your attention? This person says, I am researching books that indoctrinate children into the normalization of sexual perversity. Um, I read the rest of the form because I'm a masochist. Uh, number three, what concerns you about the resource? Please be specific in citing pa pages or passages if applicable. They say see attached. Uh, they were very specific. <laughs> they had 10 pages of quotes taken from my book um, as the attachment, um, which was kind of flattering because it meant that they actually did read the book. <laughs> and then we have number four. Uh, is there anything worthwhile in this material? Please explain. No. Um, the entire book consists of the protagonist spending the summer after his junior year of high school looking for prospects to have homosexual sex with. What I love about this is that it's actually a pretty great pitch for my book. <laughs> if you're an author, you know, you struggle with how do I condense <laughs> the complexity of my characters and the dynamics and the plot points into one single sentence, and this person did it. So that I am appreciative. <laughs> um, what's coming next? I don't remember. Right. Anyway, I don't have this big thing to say about book bans. They're happening. They have been happening for a long time. There are people in this room who 
have faced way more of that. And I just, this is my first time, and you always remember your first time. And I wanted to talk about it and say that is a reality, but despite that, despite everything, a little part of me still exists. Um, moving on from this book, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, my short stories. I write them. <laughs> I call them <laughs> queer depressing short stories for adults um, because I need that side of me to be expressed as well, not just sort of the you know, raunchy, funny, depressing teen side. I, I need to express my adult feelings as well. Uh, so I do publish these. Um, I have a website where you can find sort of a compiled list. Um, and I hope to one day have a collection out. Uh, but the last thing I'll talk about is why book number two, uh, which we'll see if it comes out. <laughs> um, but I am working on a proposal currently. I'm talking with my agent. Um, it's about high school journalism, which was very important to me in high school. Um, that's, that's literally the, my high school newspaper. Um, I don't think I was on staff at the time, but uh, it was sort of right before I started. Uh, but I was very into it, and this book is about that. And we're supposed to read something from like a work in progress. Um, so I'll just give you the first headline, because it's there are issues, there are headlines, and then just the first line of the book. A head above the rest. Headstrong 16-year-old makes headway writing headlines. <laughs> I am not the type of person who makes the same mistake twice. I am the type of person who makes the same mistake over and over and over and will continue to do so until I die. And that's the first line. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you, Aaron. Let's have some more applause for Aaron Asibi. <laughs> thank you, George Fabio. Oh, it's a good night. Um, Finally, I'd like to invite Youth Lit Week me faculty me member Mike Corrado to the stage to introduce Cecilia Ruiz. Hi. Um, I'm Mike, and I'm uh, very excited to introduce Cecilia Ruiz. Uh, Cecilia is the author, um, uh, is an author and illustrator, and received her BFA in graphic design at the Universidad um, Ibero-Americana in Mexico City. Uh, afterwards, she earned her MFA in illustration at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. Uh, now based in Brooklyn, she teaches design and illustration at Queens College and SVA. Her clients include Google, Penguin Random House, and the New York Times. Her published books include Mr. Fiorello's Head, the Book of Extraordinary Deaths, A Gift from Abuela, and The Book of Memory Gaps. She has been honored with a 2018 Best Books for Kids Award and a 2019 Picture Books for School Age Children Choices Award. Um, so Cecilia and I have some mutual friends, and uh, we haven't gotten to spend a lot of time together, but I want to spend more time together. <laughs> Can we be friends? Um, <laughs> Anyway, our, our mutual friends uh, uh, have described her as kind, generous, and genuine. Uh, she cares about the people she works with, whether they are her students, clients, or fellow illustrators. And she loves donkeys. Uh, Cecilia's sophisticatedly graphic style ranges from atmospheric and haunting to soft and endearing. Her stories vary from the enduring love of a grandmother for her grandchild to stories of loss, loss of memory, loss of life, and loss of hair. <laughs> but all told with just as much kindness and generosity as she bestows on other people and on donkeys. So please welcome Cecilia Ruiz. very nice. <laughs> thank you everyone. Thank you uh, Kyle. Thank you everyone at the Fine Arts Work Center for inviting me to be here this week. It's been a lot of fun. 
uh, and it's just been great to meet so many wonderful people. Um, so that's me. <laughs> uh, and I also, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my, my trajectory as, a, as an illustrator uh, and how I became an author. I never thought I would become an author, but it happened and I like it. <laughs> um, so I am originally from Mexico City. I was born and raised there. Uh, as Mike said, I went to college there to study graphic design. I'll tell more about that before. I'm gonna show you this cute picture of me <laughs> <laughs> with my brothers and my dog, Rocky, <laughs> not Rocky. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna show you the only drawings I have of when I was a kid. I liked drawing as a kid. And I only have, I think, three drawings. And they are all about, related kind of to sports um, <laughs> and accomplishments. So I, my dad used to run a half a marathon every year and we would go cheer for him and then I would do, do a drawing of the event afterwards. So he's in the middle wearing a medal and we're there. Um, this is another one for a following year, I guess. Uh, and th that's my dad's friends. They're all wearing medals and they're all like, their arms are <laughs> like, <laughs> like this. Um, and then there's this other one, which is me. I briefly took tennis lessons. <laughs> And I find this one the most interesting because it has, a l th these other ones are like photos. It's like I drew based on a photo or something like that. But here are, it's a little bit more action <laughs> and more storytelling. And I like the story because I won. I'm saying I, I won. Um, and then if we look closely, <laughs> This is when I think things get interesting because even as a kid, my illustrator mind was already working. And I think I was, you know, I was already trying to convey in the image how the game had gone. So this kid, her racket destroyed. <laughs> she had a horrible, horrible game. Look at all the balls she couldn't return. <laughs> And then, so my illustrator mind, I like seeing that, that I was already thinking how to tell a story beyond the page in a way. Um, and then I received a trophy <laughs> and I look, my racket is perfect. <laughs> anyway, so those are the only drawings I have from when I was a kid. Um, this is my aunt, her name is Marga and she's, She's only 10 years older than me, and I'm showing her because she was a great influence in me. She studied graphic design, so I think it was because of her that I studied graphic design, that I got to know what graphic design was, and I, I like drawing, so it was the natural thing for me to pursue. I didn't know illustration existed as a thing. I just knew that if I liked drawing and I wanted a job, it was probably smart to study graphic design. So um, moving on many years after <laughs> I graduated from graphic design, I worked at a um, graphic design studio doing very traditional graphic design, organizing type, uh, arranging information in a pleasant way. Uh <laughs> uh, I did a tequila label, it was a great design assignment. Um, and here you can see a little bit of the things I liked. Um, I like old things, so with my design and with the things I would do, I would always try to make things look a little old and worn out. Um, and I also love patterns, so this was a great project for me because I just combine many, many of the things I gravitate to towards. Um, but yeah, graphic design, this place where I worked um, was a, a design studio, but also was like a, a 
a small publishing house. So we did books there. Uh, and this was a great place for me to be because I got to see like the backstage of bookmaking. Uh, I was in the, you know, in the chain of processes to, to do. Uh, the designer is usually almost in the end and then the printing happens. So I got to see all that needs to happen for a book to come out, writers, illustrators, uh, printers, editors. So I got to see all the, all the pieces and be part of the chain. And then in this, also in this place where I worked, we also published a magazine. And this is where I got to do the, the covers for the magazines and conceptualize them, um, which was m my favorite thing to do. So just to, there's a, an idea you need to convey in an image and then just thinking what image could possibly say that as fast as possible and as clear as possible. Um, and the, the client never want, very rarely was okay with illustration. Um, they would always want a photo and it was the easiest, the fastest thing to do. We would just buy, um, images from uh, Getty or Shutterstock. Um, but every once in a while, we could convince them of using illustration for the covers. And this is when I would get to do a little bit of my illustration. And I know this happens to a lot of graphic designers because I know some. <laughs> and it's very interesting. We go into graphic design a lot of times because we love drawing and then we don't do it anymore. We kind of like, we don't do it anymore and then now we use the computer and we draw, but we draw with a computer. So all the drawing I, I used to do, I stopped doing and then I would just draw with the computer and that became my comfort zone in a way. So this was this, the type of illustration I was doing at that time. And you can see how I really love texture. I was trying to always incorporate texture and make things look aged and just with a, with a wear and tear in a way. Uh, but I was faking all that in Photoshop. <laughs> uh, this was, this is, robots were very, very popular <laughs> after I graduated. So this was a menu I did for a friend um, who opened a coffee shop and he was like, do whatever you want. So I was like, I'm going to do a cool robot <laughs> that looks retro and looks old. So, <laughs> so that, was, that was the kind of illustration I was doing. But obviously, I wanted to go back to drawing with my hands. So I enrolled in this like continuing ed program in Mexico City. It was illustration program. And it was really great because I just got to try many different medium. Like we would spend one week just playing with graphite. Then we would spend one other week uh, playing with watercolor. And there were just one week assignments. So I got to try many different medium. And then I was able to build a portfolio that then I could submit for grad school programs. This was uh, one of my projects in that course and I it's hard to see it now because it's so different from what I do. But it was one of the few moments before grad school where I got to think of a story. And I don't, I don't have all the illustrations, but we had to tell a story in six images. And the story I chose to tell was, I, I, we went out to drawing. It was part of the exercise. We were drawing on location. And then we had to make observations. And then based on that, we could develop a story. And I saw a man who was like, like this. Uh, he couldn't look up. Um, so I started thinking about him and I thought that maybe, you know, he had been a kid that loved looking down, trying to find treasures and things. Uh, but then when he eventually wanted to look at the stars, he couldn't look up. Um, so in the end, he is able to see the stars reflected on the water. That, w that was the final image. Um, so with all these images, I applied to grad school um, in 2010. And I came to New York. 
that's me. <laughs> um, and <laughs> it was really crazy for me to go to New York. It all happened very fast. Um, I'm not gonna tell the whole story, but I got accepted. I got a scholarship in August and I didn't have a school to go to. And so I emailed many schools, I emailed SVA and they were, it was luck. They were like, well, one person dropped. Uh, so if you want to apply, apply. So I applied early in August, like two weeks later they accepted me. And then and next week I had to get a visa, pack and move. So I arrived very shaky. My English was not as good as this, um, but I was there. And in one of our first classes, the teacher gave us a story and he said, you're gonna read this story and then you're gonna have to come up with a project. You, for this project, you have to come up with a series of illustrations uh, and that's it. It can be a story, it can be based on this story, whatever you want, but as long as we have a series of roughly 10 images, that's good. So this was the story we were given. And in brief, the story is about a woman with Alzheimer's and just her journey um, through the illness and her losing her identity and her memory. Um, and it was very, I feel very lucky that we got this story because I've always been fascinated with memory and just what the things we remember, the things we don't remember, how memories just pop, certain things, the smells trigger some very ch uh, childhood memories. So it was a very good project for me. So I just started doing more research about memory disorders and I didn't know there were so many and so specific. So just for example, the inability to remember faces um, there are false memories, things we remember that they happened but didn't happen, but we believe that they did happen. <laughs> um, and there was that one in particular, hyperthemesia. That one, I read about it and really stood out because it reminded me of a story, one of my favorite stories. So hyperthemesia is not loss of memory is kind of like the opposite, is when you cannot forget, so you remember everything. And there have been a few cases recorded of people that cannot forget, and they just are overwhelmed with the information. Uh, so it reminded me of one of my favorite short stories by Jorge Luis Borges called Funes de Memorias, and it's about a person with this condition. I just didn't know it was a real thing. I thought he had invented this character, and maybe he did, I don't know. But I didn't know this was a real condition. Uh, so I was like, ah, oh, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna create characters based on all different memory disorders, and that there's, that's my project. Um, so I started creating characters and just drawing them, drawing their portraits of them. So this guy suffers from visual agnosia, an impairment in recognizing visually presented objects. I don't know if you guys have heard or read the, the man who mistake his wife for a hat. So it's the same condition. Um, and then I drew a scene of the little kid with a bouquet of, of utensils. I'll read the story later. But this was a format that I wanted for, for this project. I didn't know it if it was gonna be a book. I didn't really know what it was going to be. I love Edward Gorey books, and I, he always uses vignettes as a, as a format. So I thought I'm gonna use that format because it's easier. <laughs> um, so this was another, another character. She cannot remember faces. So then she creates perfumes and gives them to the people she knows so she can recognize them when they're there. Um, so this was the idea. I, in when, while I was making this project and we were nearing the deadline, uh, we we're gonna have a show, so it needed to be presented in some form. I found this old book, and my idea was that maybe this could be the journal of a, 
uh, neurologist, like an old time, old school neurologist. Um, but that was maybe just, that I was the only person who knew that. If you saw the book, you couldn't tell. Um, so that was the, the book, and I call it the book of gaps. Um, so that was that, that was my first semester in grad school. And then I have to say that I hated the illustrations and I hated making them. I had such a hard time because I, I was not used to painting. These were watercolors and I just felt so much anxiety just having to commit to one piece of paper and if it was not I didn't want to start over, you know, so it, there was just a lot of pressure. I didn't feel super confident in my pain, painting abilities. <laughs> um, what I did enjoy were making all those borders. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> I didn't feel pressured. And I made, <laughs> made those borders just by making a little piece of them and then digitally cloning it or making it <laughs> duplicating, etc. So I felt very comfortable using my hand for a little bit and then the computer for the rest of it. So that's the, what I discovered from that first project. So for my second project in school, which was called Welcome Misfortune, <laughs> um, I created these uh, illustrations of just somehow tragedies. Um, and then I, I was also very interested in the relationship between text and image, and I wanted to explore how direct or removed from the image the text could be, uh, and how that space between the image and the text could open possibilities to imagine what this is about. Um, so they're like little poems uh, it says, it happened without noticing, no, it happened without me noticing. You suddenly became unreachable. So this tree just grew, and now that tree house, no one can get to it. Um, fly away so I can stop remembering that I once held you. And you can see that I was really into patterns here. <laughs> uh, so every, I thought, oh, I'm just gonna make patterns and then I'm gonna use them to color my images. And I had way more fun making these images than the other ones. Um, and this one, which was my favorite, uh, my soulmate, my partner, where are you? I think I'm lost. Um, so I really like working in this way because I would draw, I would do, st I would do things by hand but I wouldn't do the whole thing in one piece by hand. I would just do fragments, and then I would scan those fragments, put them together in the computer. And I had more control, less anxiety, and I, I just felt better. And I thought I was finding like a style and a voice as an illustrator, which was what I wanted to accomplish when I enrolled in, in grad school. Um, so then my thesis project, <laughs> We had to come up with an idea. It could be, for this one, it could be anything we wanted. Um, so I started doing research. Um, uh, I think, I vaguely remember that at the time I was interested in, in performers, magicians and performers, and I found a list, a Wikipedia <laughs> list called performers who died while performing. <laughs> And I was like, ooh, <laughs> this sounds very interesting. So I started looking at that list, and then Wikipedia recommended, you might like <laughs> uh, this list of unusual deaths. So I was like, okay, I do like this. <laughs> uh, and I thought it was perfect for me because, as you can see in these ones, there were more, no people, okay? My excuse was that I wanted to talk about people without showing people, but in reality, I just didn't want to draw people because I was <laughs> terrified. <laughs> so my teachers were like, you have to draw people, okay? <laughs> we need to figure that out, how that's gonna <laughs> work, work out. So I was like, okay, here I have that excuse. At some point, I'm gonna have to deal with drawing people. 
And then these stories range like from many different period times. So I was gonna be forced into doing research in terms of environments, you know, how people dress at certain times, furniture, and I was gonna have a big range in terms of doing illustrations indoors, outdoors. So it was just a really good project that was big enough. Um, so this was one image I created and this uh, story is about is um, Milo of Croton. Milo of Croton was a, a Greek wrestler and the legend says that he died. He was walking in the forest. He stumbled upon a tree trunk split with wedges and he saw it and he thought, oh, I'm going to I'll see if I'm strong enough to tear it apart. So he tried, but the tree trunk was stronger than him, and he, he got trapped in that tree trunk. And then he was later devoured by wolves. Um, so there he is, <laughs> waiting for his death, and the wolves are coming in the shadows of the trees. <laughs> <laughs> so I was also playing with visual metaphor, all these tropes of illustration that I wanted to explore. This story is uh, of Jean Baptiste Lully. He was a um, Fre French uh, music composer and director, conductor, conductor. Um, and he, at that time, it was customary to conduct with a baton and banging on the floor. And he was vigorously conducting, and he pierced his foot with the baton, and then he died of um, gangrene. Um, I, when I started this project, I said to myself, I'm not going to show blood. That was one of my rules. But this is the only one where I was like, OK, I'm going to show blood. <laughs> 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 uh, but it's not too much. Um, and I wanted to show they appreciate that he had done a very good job conducting that night. Um, <laughs> and this one is actually my favorite of that series. And it was the first image I came up with. And I thought that it set the tone for the kind of approach I wanted to have with the book. This is the death of Isadora Duncan. She was a dancer, an American dancer. And she died when her long scarf got caught in the wheel of the car in which she was a passenger. So this was a puzzle to me, how, how to show that, how to show it uh, without showing it. I didn't want to show it. Uh, and then also, this project, I was going to have text there. So I didn't want to say the same thing twice. So I really, with this project, it really forced me to think how what to show, what not to show. And then because I was, it was going to be a series, I couldn't use the same device every single time. So sometimes I would have to think, OK, maybe I show what happened before the event, maybe after. So this one is an aftermath. This one is the moment before. Um, and then <laughs> I was showing this to my students. And it's true, I th think the image works just by showing her hand. We don't need to show her all. Uh, but I'm very lazy. <laughs> and if I can get away with just showing a hand instead of showing the entire person, I will do it. <laughs> uh, and then I also love symmetry. So if you can see these objects there, the table is perfectly symmetrical. I only drew half of it. <laughs> and then I mirror it. <laughs> <laughs> so then I, I made a box. This was the box of extraordinary death. So it was my idea is that it was going to be a box like postcards and people in the show could look at the postcard image on the front story on the back. And this is how the show looked. There was a box. So that was all my grad school. <laughs> um, but so then I, we graduated, and my teachers were, you have to promote yourself. 
um, so I did. <laughs> I sent postcards to different uh, art directors, um, editors, just found names, wrote them, sent them a package with this death. And I got, I got two <laughs> responses. I got two responses. One said, thank you for your postcards. They're great. The end. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was this other one from an editor at Penguin Random House. And she was like, oh, thank you for your postcards. They're great. And we have a project that is very, very similar to what you did. And I think it needs illustrations. So do you want to do the illustrations? And I said, yes, of course. So this was uh, a novel for young adults called Seven Deadlies. And there were one short story for each deadly sin. So it needed one illustration, one full illustration, and one chapter opener. So I did that. And then I, when I went to meet the editor, I was like, well, let me show you the things I've done. Uh, and I showed her my book of gaps, and she liked it. Um, and she said, let's make it. <laughs> um, but at that time, I didn't like the illustrations at all. And then on top of that, we needed more stories because I only had like 10, 8, I don't remember. So I redid the, the characters and the scenes in the style that I was working that I liked more. Uh, so I'll read them. I'll read this one to you. Uh, Valentin does not remember how certain objects look. Thus, he often mistakes one thing for another. Lately, he has been carrying around all kinds of bouquets. It appears the little boy is in love. Nadia. Even though Nadia has never seen the ocean, she believes she remembers swimming in it. She vividly recalls its smell and the way the salt water made her eyes sting. She remembers an unfamiliar vastness she longs to feel again. And Lucia. The farthest Lucia was able to get out of her house was determined by the number of scarves she owned. She started mistrusting her memory two years before, when one afternoon she was unable to find her way home. There was another story in this book that was based on my great-grandmother. We called her Coca. She loved Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> she did. That's all she drank. She never drank a drop of water. <laughs> <laughs> and she lived to be 98. <laughs> um, but I loved, I loved her. Uh, she was really funny. But this thing happened to her that is kind of funny, but it's kind of sad. Um, she... Um, she worked at the bank, at the National Bank in Mexico. Uh, this is not very important, but <laughs> in Mexico, in Mexico, there was a, a big economical crisis in the 90s. Um, so for a decade, let's say from the 80s to the 90s, there was huge inflation. So for example, if a cup of coffee was at the beginning of the decade, it was 10 pesos. By the end of the decade, it was 10,000 pesos, OK? So th we had to deal with very big numbers to do small transactions. So in the 90s, the government decided that it was just easier to make new money, reprint new money, take down three zeros from the currency, and have new bills. And people had to go to the bank and exchange those bills, the old bills for the new bills. They were called nuevos pesos. So we, I, I was little at this time, but we, all, I remember this. We all had to do this. Uh, so then, fast forward ten years later, after this or more, we were cleaning my great grandma's home, and we found a bag of money that she had been saving, and she forgot. She simply forgot that she had been saving all this money, and it was the old money. So we couldn't switch it anymore. So it was useless. 
uh, and I remember we all find it very amusing, but my great grandma was not amused. I remember seeing her face like a little embarrassed, a little sad. It was a lot of money she could have bought, maybe a car with that money. I still, we st play with those bills, Monopoly and games. I still have those bills um, as a token. But I included that story in my book. And then my agent at the time, uh, she, she went to my book event for this book. And, sh and I had told her that I wanted to make a book, a children's book about a grandma, because my grandma had just passed away. And she was like, why don't you make a book about that story? And I was like, OK, I'll do it. <laughs> so then I, this was my first book. I, I say this, it is, this is my first book for children. The other ones, I don't think they are for children, even though they kind of look like children illustration. Um, but this is, and it's called A Gift from Abuela. And it tells the story of a grandma and her granddaughter. They have a very close relationship. And the grandma, she wants to, they do a lot of things together, and the grandma wants to save money to buy a gift for the granddaughter. But then the crisis happens, and she forgets. You'll have to read it. <laughs> uh, it's there. <laughs> but, uh, but this was great for me, this project, because first I really embraced my childlike illustration style here. With my other books, especially with the deaths one, because I knew they were for adults. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to go back that much. It's too much. Anyway, uh, but uh, I had a hard time with the illustrations because I knew they had to look a little more realistic in a way because they were real people, real stories. So I had a hard time with the illustration. In this one, I really liked just geometric, flat, doing that. Um, and then because I got to think about my childhood and memories and places that I used to go to, this is the uh, meat shop near my grandparents' house where we bought meat. Uh, and there it is in the illustrations. <laughs> um, Benches, classic benches of Mexico City, if you've been. There's my version. Boss. Anyway, all these little things that feel very familiar to me. Then I got to draw my cousins and myself. That's me looking sad, even though I have a marshmallow necklace. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was really great project and then with the same editor that i had worked for the memory books she wanted to do the extraordinary deaths she wanted to do the box but it was too expensive to produce so we said okay let's make a book so with this one again i got uh, got the chance the rare chance of redo stuff and rethink it uh, and it's just great i felt like with my this was this were some of the images from my thesis in grad school and I was just trying different things in terms of um, visual communication and how to tell a story in one image or with a sequential. But I felt like there was not um, like a unifying principle within, within all the images. Um, so I redid a lot of, of the images. Uh, and I feel like now they look a little more cohesive. This is the story of Frank Hayes, who was a jockey who died of a heart attack during the course of his first race at Belmont Park, New York. His inner body, still on the saddle, finished first place. Uh, this one is crazy. An entire visiting soccer team was killed by lightning during a match in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Every player on the opposing home team survived. And this one, the Collier brothers were an extreme case of compulsive hoarding. 
They were both found dead in their home in Harlem, buried by over 120 tons of clutter. So when I was telling you about like, I felt like the images needed to look more cohesive. I was trying to, first, I this project was a challenge because the stories are gruesome, um, they're shocking, and I didn't want the images to, I thought it was very easy to for the images to look sensationalist, and I didn't want that. I didn't want to make fun of the people who perished. Um, <coughs> so I thought it was a difficult act. Um, so I tried to focus more on the environment in these images more than in the individual. So I tried to make the environment more of the character in these stories. So in terms of scale, m a lot of the images have huge skies. Uh, it takes most of the composition, the sky. Um, like this one, um, and here is an interior, but again, I wanted the, the environment to feel overwhelming because I mean the story, so it fit, fit this fits the story, but again, I wanted the environment to be telling the story. Um, okay, last. This is the, the last book. <laughs> but it's true what Mike said about the, my recurrent themes, death, memory, loss. There's always some loss um, in the stories that I, that I like. Um, so this one, is this, uh, this book was supposed to be out now, but it got delayed. It's coming out in the fall. It's called Mr. Fiorello's Head. Um, and I'm gonna read to you just the beginning. <laughs> okay. Mr. Fiorello's head once had hair, thick, lush, curly locks used to complement and frame Mr. Fiorello's remarkably round face. He's so handsome. <laughs> <laughs> During the day, Mr. Fiorello's hair would rustle and sway. At night, it would pillow Mr. Fiorello's head while he dreamed. Mr. Fiorello loved his hair and never wanted it to go away. But sometimes, the things we care about the most, the things we never want to see gone, live anyway. This is how Mr. Fiorello found himself with only three hairs atop his, his head. Mr. Fiorello appreciated their will to stay, but they just drew more attention to his barren head. And I'm gonna leave a cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> so you pre-order it <laughs> because it's out for pre-order right now. That's it. Thank you. I actually have a question for Cecilia that Sarah can also answer. Um, you, so you talked about, for one of the projects, I forget which, your favorite image was the first one you did. And I'm wondering how you maintain momentum when you already made your favorite thing. And again, that's like if you wrote your favorite scene yeah. and then, yeah. I think I just, is it on? 
Sí, sí, no. Ah. I, I mean, first, I had a deadline, so <laughs> that for me is the biggest Motivator. engine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When I know that someone is expecting something from me. So even without momentum, I have to do it. But then having that first piece that I really, really liked, I didn't know it was my favorite at the moment. I thought maybe I could do better or that I would like another one. But I think it set the tone. Mm -hmm. So I was aiming to get to that level, whatever that meant. Mm. Uh, it turned out that it, that was my <laughs> favorite. So I didn't, <laughs> I didn't went over that one, yeah. but yeah. And like children, they're all favorites, aren't they? <laughs> um, no, some I like better than others. Uh, not kids, the books and the stories. But I don't know, I think it's, um, yeah, keeping, uh, you know, I've talked a lot about this in seminar this week, is like we're doing a lot of generative work that's getting the students to think about their younger selves and doing a lot of sense memory stuff and, um, and I think it's always making sure that you're writing for kids today or your audience today, but you um, want to write for your kid self. And my kid self liked a lot of different things and also needed to hear a lot of things that I wasn't ready for and needed needs to play, you know. So I think it's just finding that, that stuff. What about you? Yeah, what about you, Aaron? Well, um... Like, book-wise, I'm scared because I do like This Is Why They Hate Us a lot better <laughs> than, like, my second play, and I could tell you guys that. Um, but I think with scenes, though, like, when I write out of order, the scene I usually love is the end of the second act, which is, like, the character's lowest point. Mm -hmm. And, like, writing out of order helps with that because I think I'm trying to just sort of build, like, a display case around that scene and make it the most emotional thing even though it's already gonna that's gonna be the case like going back to the beginning and just trying to build up to it like that it's not the most fun thing but it it makes the most fun thing even more fun I think um, I wanted to craft a question for all three of you, and it just occurred to me that um, you're all, you, you all have a kind of mastery of comedy and the comic, and so I'd like you to speak in any way you want to about crafting, emerging, um, or finishing any kind of comic impulse, whether it's dark comedy, biting, savage, horror. Well, um you know, my lament, well, my lament is in my second book, I had a great fart joke. <laughs> They're not in dead flip or here to stay, unfortunately. But, um, but I think, w you know, comedy I've always used as a, um, it's a healing thing, but it's also a welcoming thing, and it's also a defense mechanism. So as you're a comic, you know, and you also you know, uh, don't want to generalize, but I know a lot of funny people who are sometimes sad in their private life. Um, not to say I'm sad all the time, but I have sad moments, and I think there's something about knowing both of those things to understand comedy. Um, and in a horror comedy, you know, uh, it makes it so much more fun in a lot of ways, but I think I was leaning more into the comedy because that's what I'm more familiar with, and that's what I, that's like a, power I have and my editor made the point that um, make sure that the horror isn't puncturing the the comedy isn't puncturing the scary moment because I could find the jokes anywhere like I could find the funny and all this kind of silly stuff but then you're I'm not leaning into the scares because I'm afraid of everything and I'm afraid I'm not being scary enough or that I'm I'm playing with a genre that I enjoy but I don't feel equipped to do and so that was learning that too. It's like not everything is funny, right? Like even if there's a joke there or something, it's like knowing the balance and making sure that the comedy doesn't puncture the scene. It can enhance it if, if it's, you know, working, but um, 
Yeah, just having that balance of it. Similar to that point, um, I would say people always say kill your darlings, but like I don't do that, and it's because I know down the line someone's gonna tell me no if it's bad, or at least hopefully, right? Like my agent or my editor. So I don't really hold back with jokes. There was this really bad joke, and this is why they hate us about Shakira, where it was like, <laughs> la 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 la. <laughs> You're here. No, oh, uh, I'm on tonight. <laughs> in disguise. Um, but it was like, there was this joke about where the kid's like, I feel like Shakira in that song underneath your clothes where it's like, um, uh, she's singing to a guy. She's like, you're my, you're my territory for being such a good girl, something like that. He's like, I feel like Shakira, but I'm not a girl. But it was just really convoluted. And my agent was literally just like, cut that. <laughs> like, it's please take this out. And I was like, okay, but I'm glad I had it in there because I was like, what if that had been a good joke? Um, so, like, I just, my plan is, like, to always, like, kind of go all out. I'm here, I'm interested to hear what you say, because your humor is, like, so subtle. Um, but um, there's that, and then there's also something else I forgot, but I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> I, I feel similar to you, where I think my type of comedy is always attached to a heartache and just, like, sadness. Uh, so... I think that's where I find it. I don't seek out to be funny or to do comedy, but I like those moments where I like those moments where you don't know what you're su how you're supposed to feel, um, and you feel both things. Like those moments where maybe you see something that is funny, but it also makes your heart uh, ache. So I, that's the kind of comedy that I'm interested in. Uh, but it's like my the memory gaps book my editor and the marketing department they had to label my book and they wrote humor in on the back of the book and i don't think it should belong to the humor section um so i think a lot of people find it very funny i don't but yeah i mean yeah <laughs> You all uh, talked about revisiting work that you did previously, and especially when you were a student, when you were first coming up and first learning. And I'm really curious to hear you talk about the difference between the impulse to create something new and to follow a new journey and to create new characters and develop new worlds versus the impulse to revisit something from your past work, from your body of work that maybe you weren't, I don't know how you would frame it around like it wasn't ready yet. It needed you to grow before you could come back to it. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear you speak to both of those ways of a work coming into uh, life with public readers. Yeah. Uh, well, I. it's funny, like a lot of uh, my students will ask me, you know, what do you do when you finish something and you keep tinkering with it and you're moving commas and, you know, you're stuck? And I just say, put, don't look at it. <laughs> like, give yourself however long it takes, but, like, give yourself some time to not look at it and then you'll see it with more fresh eyes. And, like, that kind of just happens naturally sometimes, and that's what happened with This Is Why They Hate Us. It's like, I shelved it because I was scared of what would happen if I published it. Um, and so by the time I came back to it, because I was lazy and didn't want to write a fifth book, um, I was sort of, I was like, oh, like I can make this better because I feel like I have grown and, you know, so that, yeah, that distance just really helps you and then you read things that sort of become models and, yeah. Um, I think for me it was very, very useful and helpful that I did these projects. I started them in school and I think this is why I think these kind of workshops are really, really great because when I did those projects in school, I didn't know that they would become books, like real things. They were just projects. So I didn't think of the, the final project, the final product. Um, and I think that gave me freedom. I was then lucky to revisit them and kind of like do the things that you would change if you could. But I think that's why something like this and just a framework like school is great to come up with projects that then later years later you could revisit and they could become 
something else or more robust? Um, yeah, it's, you know, I've, I've done things where I've had an idea or I have something that I think might be a cool concept or something I want to explore, but I don't write it till a lot later. Um, I don't know that that means it's not ready yet. It's more like what, what is taking up a lot of your head space and heart space at present. And um, so like, like that story isn't ready yet because I'm not ready yet, even if you're like tinkering or you're doing things. And, and I have a file that's called scraps and I just put everything that I've cut or everything and it's just all in one giant. So they're all from different projects, but it's in scraps. So you can come back and play with them later, um, but uh, yeah, like for like in 2018, I was really obsessed with drive-in movie theaters. And I was like, that's gonna be something, and I was researching. I'm like, this is something, and it was nothing <laughs> um, until um, next month. I'm in a short story collection. Um, it's a horror young adult collection called Night of the Living Queers. And it's about two employees at a drive-in movie theater who their boss is um, attacked by something while they're at work. And so they visit him in hospital and he says, you have to be at the drive-in at midnight and play this movie, but then leave. And um, let's just say there might be some visitors that are from elsewhere who visit the drive-in. Um, but that that's years from when I wanted to explore that sort of thing. So they all, it just kind of, it's where you're at, I think. Well, I, I just had a question for Aaron. What's your middle name? <laughs> so I can make this joke because I don't think there are any like child children here. Um, I always say the H stands for horny, because um, all my books have to deal with like these little weird horny kids, because that's who I was. Uh, but actually, Henry. They sound alike, yeah. Same same amount of letters and s begins and starts the same way. It's just. Hey, thanks guys for being talented and cool. Good job, and thank, thank you for you being here. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you.